Hi, this is Roger Craver, the agitator, and welcome to the uh, webinar, Control Beating Supporter uh, Journeys. A couple of housekeeping items for today's session. One, it will be recorded. Secondly, please ask any questions you wish in the uh, question column, and if we don't have time to answer them in this session, we will answer them individually, and we will also aggregate uh, multiple questions of the same uh, topic and send those out to the group. As I said, this will be uh, recorded and a copy uh, will be available sent to you afterward. So let me introduce uh, today's uh, experts. We have Kevin Schulman, who's the uh, founder and, and uh, CEO of Donor Voice. Many of you have uh, seen me write about his work and research. He's uh, an attitudinal and behavioral scientist with a lot of experience in consumer and donor research and today you're going to find and bring this expertise to bear on the issue of uh, donor insights uh, and donor journeys in ways that explain donors uh, behavior. With him today is Josh Wishard who will come uh, at the end of uh, Kevin's presentation who's a, also a partner in Donor Voice and a veteran of 15 years in agency in the agencies in the nonprofit sector. And he's going to share a case study of a charity that is, uh, is now in the process of rolling out a control beating supporter journey pilot program after uh, one year of, uh, of testing, a program that's going to raise uh, more than 15% net income and set the stage for growth of this organization. Now let me tell you why I wanted to do this with the, uh, with the agitator. As you'll see in this cartoon, the, we, we talk a lot about being donor centric and a lot about uh, donor journeys. And unfortunately, there's an awful lot of common jargon that's used by people who speculate what a donor journey is all about and uh, what it really is all about and how you find out, most importantly, what type of journey mapping is really, uh, is really important. And let's, let's just uh, assume at the start that everyone understands that the reason to, to really pay attention to journey mapping is that uh, it results in better supporter experience that translates into uh, improved outcomes in terms of value and retention and the actions you take towards your uh, donor. But you know, I, at, uh, at the agitator, Tom and I see an awful lot of uh, nonsense uh, come in over the transom and an awful lot of uh, words and jargon that it's, they all use the same, same terms, experience, pain point, touch point, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But but mostly it's uh, it's conjecture and and uh, and guesswork. So it's it's sort of a flat Earth approach to uh, to looking at this process of uh, of journey mapping versus uh, really using a round Earth uh, GPS approach uh, with with evidence based uh, evidence based activity to to control those or to guide those those journeys. So the, the, the point of today's webinar, I hope to, uh, to leave you with, is that the only thing that's worth doing in a journey mapping exercise is to engage in, in something that is an in-market test and control situation where you set up at the outset metrics that will enable you to judge success or, uh, or failure. So one of the one of the problems, and I've I've seen this over the uh, over the years, and I'm sure most of the people here this morning have, have seen it also. We you know we gather together all the appeals and all the communications, and some organizations even stretch a clothesline across the conference room ceiling and hang stuff with clothespins from it to kind of get an idea of what what communications is uh, is going out and then they, they sort of brainstorm and they and their consultants and maybe they call in the donor service manager to see what the donors uh, are saying what are the what are the pain points but they uh, they then use all that uh, uh, fun uh, fun activity It'd be actually it's great for a Friday afternoon beer blast but it isn't very 
very empirical. And so they suddenly come up with these ideas, well, we could improve it this way and this way and this way, and suddenly that becomes the uh, the journey uh, mapping. But there's uh, there's pretty good evidence, not pretty good, very good evidence that that just uh, isn't an effective process. And while it may be fun, it's not worth uh, very much time and money. So I'm going to ask Kevin to uh, start and just really challenge my challenge my point, Kevin. If I'm if I'm off base, that uh, that that normal type of exercise in in journey mapping, no matter what terms we use and no matter whether all the terms seem to be the same, is really not very productive. Yeah, thanks, Roger. I think I'm going to wind up uh, affirming the point there that this this idea that we we as fundraising experts have a good handle on what what drives donor behavior. The the slide that you're seeing now, the blue diamonds reflect 20 different. This is from Oxfam UK. This was published in a blog post. 20 different Oxfam UK product or offer ideas that are ranked from the most to the least popular based on donor, donor rate ratings of those ideas. Those are the blue diamonds, right? The red squares are showing the internal staff ratings on those exact same ideas. And so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that there's hardly any similarity. And <laughs> if you look at the top three rated ideas by the donors, they equate to some of the uh, most poorly rated by staff. And Paul at, at Oxfam UK, who's a friend, I think summed it up best. People who work at Oxfam are a very poor guide to what supporters are going to think. And this has serious implications for innovators in charities. And as, as a final kind of cautionary note, I expect there's a lot of folks on this call and just in the sector generally who are looking at this and thinking, yeah, well, you know, maybe the staff do know best, and maybe the donors, you know, they don't do what they say, and they're, maybe the ideas they like just aren't going to raise a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I'd, I'd leave you with, uh, on this little uh, story, one very sobering stat. Oxfam UK had a recent eight-year stint, that's 96 months, where it lost more donors than it gained every single month in all but eight of the 96 months. And Oxfam UK is one of the best charities out there. Staff are extremely skilled at the mechanics of fundraising. They've got a very innovative culture and mindset, and they're very good at idea generation. But we should never mistake those qualities for expertise in human behavior. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is what one of our, our clients dubbed this outside in approach thinking that was contrasted with their description of their approach, insular and, and personal preference based. And what you're seeing on the screen now, in addition to that quote, is a, a screenshot of mapping software that was fit for purpose, so it's better than clothesline or, or God forbid, sticky notes or Excel, showing the, the supporter journey for this particular charity, and we've labeled that current state. And as you can see, it's a single row. Why? Because everybody gets the same thing. Now, the other thing that you're seeing within this screenshot are a variety of little icons or what we would refer to as virtual sticky notes on these various communications. Stop sign on the welcome pack, stop sign on this email, uh, a yield sign that's indicating, uh, as you can see over here, we need to revise the content. This, this was arrived at not through an insular kind of sitting around a room and, and making judgments and, and staring at the welcome pack and deciding whether it was good or bad. It was made based on empirical outside in donor insights about what works and what doesn't and whether or not the answers differ by segment. And so what's the outcome from the donor insights that led to this set of discoveries around their current journey? Well, uh, without going into full-blown detail, what you're going to see, this is a test in market right now, and there are two rows. What does that mean? Well, it means we have now identified two groups that are very different in their preferences and their needs and their motivations for support, and so the journey is different between the two, but also radically different from the control. And 
year to date, we're up on retention. This is among current donors, 5%. It's worth noting that, that Sargent et al. have, have uh, just discovered or found in, in their research that uh, a 10% increase in, can increase the value of the house by about 200%. So that 5% increase is uh, significant. But the point I really want to underscore is that this was – Insights work that led to in-market supporter journey testing with the only metrics that actually matter, which are financial. We don't have soft, fuzzy metrics around this pilot. And if you're doing uh, journey mapping that's not going in market for testing, or if you're doing it with uh, pseudo testing that has a bunch of soft metrics, then it's a waste of money. It's a waste of the donor's money. All right, so what's the secret to this outside-in type approach? Well, there's really no secret at all. It, it, it comes from, in the case of, of donor voice, but I would argue any entity that's going to do this well, whether it's in-house or bringing in outside consultants or some combination, years of formal academic training in a variety of social science and mathematical disciplines combined with years of applied fundraising work. And to what aim do we apply this subject matter expertise? Because everyone wants some more detail here, right? Well, the, we apply this subject matter expertise to a rather simple uh, uh, set of questions here. Which experiences matter? And does this answer differ by segment? Now, our way at, at arriving at the answers to those questions relies on the commitment model and identifying segments that have different identities. And we're going to expand on both of these in brief and then with the two case studies go into more detail. So this thing called the commitment model. Now it, conceptually it starts with behavior change as the end game. And it doesn't matter if it's giving behavior or doing behavior, meaning this framework, this model to understand and identify which touch points or experiences matter can be aimed at, at advocates, donors, and, and the combination thereof. And it also starts with, conceptually, the, the hopefully very intuitive, comfortable, comforting view that the donor's evaluation of all of the experiences and interactions they have with you, it actually matters. It influences their behavior. Now, you have loads of behavior data in your CRM. But what you don't have in the CRM are these donor measures of the quality of the experiences that you provide. And step one is to collect that bit in a survey. And so it becomes, in that way, very bespoke to the charity, a, a long laundry list of interactions or experiences, and in this survey, collecting that missing uh, satisfaction or experience rating data. Now, as the big piece of uh, white space here is, is suggesting, there's, there's something that sits between the experiences that you're serving up all with enormous time, effort, and spend, and the behavior we, we're after. That, that is important to, to crack the code on determining which experiences matter. Uh, because as it turns out, the, the, the quality of the experiences and the judgment that they're making about the quality of those experiences has an indirect impact on behavior, not a direct impact. And if we want to find out which of these experiences matter, and we do, if we're going to get tactical and applied with an in-market pilot that's got financial goals around it or expectations, you've got to measure what these experiences, these judgments about these experiences directly impact. And collectively, which is what's reflected with these three circles and the nine questions, is measures of satisfaction. These are all subconscious sort of latent things that they're going to make judgments about. Satisfaction, reliability, their emotional connection, trust, commitment. Again, all those words tend to get written up and thrown around sort of willy-nilly. And, and what you can take from this, those, those constructs, those dimensions, those mental uh, um, judgments, satisfaction, reliability, trust, they're real, they matter, they have a really big influence on whether folks stick around. You can actually measure all of those things, which is what these magic nine questions do, and then <clears throat> you can model out to determine which of these experiences are actually having a causal impact on those latent dimensions. Now, none of this data is in your CRM either. So you've got to ask these magic nine questions within that same survey that's collecting the donor's quality ratings on your experiences. The end result from this is a determination of which experiences and touch points should be dropped, meaning the interactions have no causal bearing on 
this piece in the middle and therefore behavior. Interactions that need to be fixed, this is the often tossed around donor pain point that is, again, a, a real concept in that we've identified through this process, this experience is having a causal effect on their strength of relationship, which is another summary way to describe these three circles, and it's actually a negative experience. So their quality judgment is it's not very good. That's a fixed opportunity, so we've got drop, fix, and then to round out the trifecta, scaled. scaled Scaled means that it's a winning interaction. Sometimes it gets talked about in, in the you know, supporter journey, customer experience world as a wow moment. Uh, that's a bit of a... Hey, hey Kevin. Uh, yep. uh, Kevin, Roger. Uh, give, a, give a couple of examples of, uh, of for, for example, uh, uh, experiences or touch points that, uh, that should be dropped. Uh, what, what have you, what, what, maybe some things that have surprised you as, you as you've done this for organizations? And then some that uh, that were important and could be fixed. Uh, could you just give a couple of illustrations so uh, if the folks there don't understand, I need to understand. Yeah, and I guess I'd say that the, the answer always differs when we do this across charities, even if we're doing, and we have, charities that, that on paper look pretty darn similar, right? So they're all in the international relief space. They're all of roughly equal size, probably recruiting basically the same donors off the same lists uh, or in the same street corners if we're in the UK or Europe. Uh, so the answer is always very different. So the idea that there's a best practice that you need to have a newsletter is nonsense. Uh, that that's not true. I mean, some of the the underlying aims or goals that you might have with your newsletter uh, are, are absolutely imperative. But whether or not your newsletter is delivering on those underlying goals, th there is no uh, best practice answer. And so I think the idea that newsletter is best practice is is, is grossly kind of misinforms the sector. It's the intent or purpose of that, and maybe the newsletter can do it, but there's lots of other things that can as well. And so we have found instances uh, on that point where the newsletter is great. Why? Not because it's a newsletter per se, but because it's delivering on those underlying goals, which are typically um, non-financial. They're trying to um, reinforce the original decision to give, to demonstrate how the money is being spent. Some may ask for money as well. But you get the idea. It's, it's, the experiences, just to sort of round out that thought, can range from, when we talk about experience and touch point, because that is uh, certainly jargon, it can range from the very tangible thing that you can print out and, in fact, hang from the clothesline, so a newsletter, print or digital, uh, the welcome pack, but it also includes um, interactions, so those interactions with supporter services, right? What, what's, what's the quality of those? Are those things doing their job from the donor's perspective? And to the, to the super abstract, which is core message, right? If a core message is doing its job, it ought to be contributing to their sense of satisfaction and reliability and trust and emotional connection. And if it's not, then um, you wouldn't see that relationship. Did that answer the question? Yep. Okay. All right, so just to round this out, we've got drop, fix, scale. Scale is, is just the, the third leg of the stool where we've got these experiences that are having a positive impact on relationship and behavior, and it's a really good experience. So what can we do with that content or with that uh, that touch point to get greater uh, exposure for it? And then the, 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 the final bit is whether or not those drop, fix, scale findings are different for different identities. So what the heck is an identity? Well, another way to, to think about identity is, is segmenting based on motivation or reason for supporting you. And, and we all have lots of different identities. And these identities tend to have different goals and values associated with them. And when there's a given identity that's activated or made relevant, and there always is, whether we're activating it or they are subconsciously, when there's a given identity that's activated or made relevant, people in that context, in that situation, are going to behave in ways that are in keeping with the goals and the values of that identity. Identity causes behavior. And so as a quick example, my attire, the, the words that I use, my behavior, my judgment about whether an experience is good or bad is going to be very different if I'm at my child's school 
wearing subconsciously, figuratively, my parent identity versus a Redskins football game with my sports identity. Okay, and, and our job in life as marketers and fundraisers is to understand which identity they're bringing to the fundraising party and, and the values and goals that go with that and having every experience, directly or indirectly, reinforce the values and the goals that are attached to that identity. That's how you get a donor for life, and I'm sorry to report there is no shortcut. All right, so as promised, this is case study one of two that's going to give, peel back the layers of the onion a bit more and talk about how this is, is applied and what the upside is. So <clears throat> this is a conservation charity, and they came to us at a point where they had already done a very robust segmentation, and these are uh, have been anonymized a bit here, but these are the, these are the segments that they had identified through a, an, a, an attitudinal clustering exercise, which is pretty common. And they'd actually managed, which is less common, to score these customer segments on the database so they could actually find the people that fell into these respective buckets uh, on their current database. And they were using it in, in a limited way for, for selection. But their real aim and the real desire was to get different supporter journeys, and they just didn't know how to go from here to visually what you see on the right-hand side. How do we get a sense of tactically at the touch point level which touch points or experiences do we drop, fix, and scale, and does that answer differ across the segments? Now, one of the questions that you got to ask yourself when you have one of these attitudinal segmentations, and this gets a little wonky, but it's critical. Uh, it, the question you've got to ask is, is grouping people by their general attitudes on a topic, and in this case it's conservation, but insert the topic that fits your charity and your business there. Is grouping people by their general attitudes on that topic the same <clears throat> as grouping them by why they financially support you? And the answer is almost always no. And in this case, the answer is no. There were, there were no differences in commitment level or motivation or needs by these groups. But we had a bit of an ace up our sleeve, and the ace up our sleeve was a very charity-specific, hypothesis-based identity question that when you strip away all the words I just used, it's pretty darn simple, right? And that's the, the upside of identity and getting into the identity business is that practically it seems really obvious after the fact. In this case, and we've anonymized things a bit, they had people who were really into bears and people who were really into nature. Uh, as another example for any health charity, the identity, and this again sounds really obvious after the fact, the identity that is driving the vast majority of behavior from your best supporters, who are of course providing the, va the, the vast majority of your revenue, is their connection to the cause, right? Do I have MS? Do, did I suffer from a heart attack? Um, do I have some form of cancer, or am I a survivor, or am I a caregiver for a person in one of those categories? Far and away, without question, that is the main reason that people are giving to health charities, at least the ones who are sticking around and contributing the vast majority of the revenue. So again, these identities become pretty obvious after the fact. And so we had hypothesized up front in conjunction with the client that, you know, we're going to take a look at these segments, but let's also be open to the possibility that the answer is sitting uh, right in front of us and pretty darn obvious. And in fact, when we modeled out which touch points matter for these groups, bear versus nature, we got very different answers. Now, this slide is output from the commitment model, and it's very involved, and we've actually grossly simplified what we found for this particular client for purposes of this discussion. Now, there's, there's three main takeaways here, but just by way of quick orientation, this is where we have asked those nine com commitment questions, and then for everything where you see a financial figure or over in this drop category, there was a much longer list, we got those quality experience measures that I mentioned, and we combined all of this with the CRM behavior data. So the three main takeaways, you're only going to get this level of detailed insight, which you need 
if you're going to have a control beating journey with this model because it's built on knowing how relationships are formed and how to measure and analyze it. The, and the only way that you can really get applied is you've got to have this touch point level insight, which is exactly what this is providing. And that touch point level insight can be grouped into a, this very simple and useful rubric of keep, fix, and drop. And the answer that we in this case found was different for bear versus nature. That's a segmentation that you're only going to arrive at when you're thinking with your identity hat on. This shows the, in, in a just simple little table, the variety of ways that the bear journey is different from the nature journey and how they're both very different from the control, where in the control world, everyone's just getting a random smattering of everything. This is the initial evidence that this identity-based outside-in journey is working. This is day one, month one for a year-long test. What you're seeing here is a, a telemarketing script. This is for new supporters who are calling in to register for an outdoor activity that was marketed by the charity. Half of the folks calling in start their journey with this test telemarketing script, and the other half get the control. And in the test treatment, what we've included is we're asking the identity question. So all 15,000 donors in our test group are going to have this appended to their record. And we absolutely have to know this in order to know which journey to send them on after the call. However, we also took opportunity within this call to reinforce the identity info that they just shared, right? Very conversational and de demonstrating reciprocity right off the bat. You've said something, I'm being responsive to that. And so we're, we're taking the opportunity to reinforce that identity and as a part of making a financial ask to sign up for monthly membership. Because again, this is just a hand raiser campaign to participate in an activity, but we're taking opportunity, as does the control, to make an ask for monthly membership. And these are results just off of this initial starting touch point for the supporter journey, 15% increase in the conversion rate, and 10 pounds more in donor value. And while that's cool, uh, the, the information that we get, and this is the part that's got to be underscored here, is a lot more valuable than this, this bump in the initial um, interaction. All right, so now let me with hopefully not breaking anything, turn this over to Josh, who's going to take us through case study number two. Josh, you should have the screen now, yeah? Okay. Are you seeing uh, Yep. Yep. that's now in presentation mode, you see that? Yep, good. Okay. All right. Thank you. So this, this case study I'm going to walk through now has been in market for over a year. So we have some very specific findings we'll share on what was learned and the results associated with the changes that were made. But also as part of this, I'm going to actually spend a, a little bit of time up front explaining the work that we did together with the organization to determine the strategies and tactics that would, would be our focus as well as how we selected the audience. So some of the nuts and bolts, if you will, of how do you get from insights to application? How do you actually get into market with the pilot? There's a lot of decisions that need to be made and some considerations to be thought through. So I'm going to give you part of that uh, as I kind of dig into uh, this case study. One of the uh, kind of key differences that's worth pointing out from in this, in this case study, different from what Kevin was just walking through, is in Kevin's example, there were distinct identities. And I think there's uh, while I think it's important and it's likely there's there's uh, when people talk about pilots and, and, and donor journeys that what this means is you're going to end up with 47 different donor journeys and a cohort of 12 people and that is not always the case and in, in, in the case that Kevin explained there was two and in, in the example that we're going to share, share here there's actually one identity so it's effectively it's a new uh, customer journey or donor journey that was done to a representative uh, sample of the entire active file. Um, that's not to say that with this organization there is an opportunity and we'll, and we'll very likely continue to chase uh, kind of more robust answers around identity as segments or other advanced segmentation, but it wasn't necessarily a requirement for us to get the, if you will, the bang for the buck uh, by kind of investing here. 
I'm a I'm a big believer in the kind of crawl walk run framework in that uh, you know anything is better than nothing. So kind of in the crawl phrase. So while I think that this is a uh, the run phase, uh, kind of the the holy grail is to get to a point where you do have identified uh, segments based ideally on this identity, uh, and you're chasing that. Uh, this is an example where we got meaningfully improved results and where I would kind of classify them as part of kind of that, let's say, the walk phase for a number of reasons. So very quickly, I'll, you know, the, the, the process with all of our pilots, the primary input for the pilot is that initial donor inside work that gives us that view from the outside end lens that Kevin was referring to in the beginning here. And I think this is critical to kind of building this effective donor journey. Uh, this is kind of their uh, blueprint, and this is a very consolidated version of what we refer to as one of the core outputs of, of this insights work is what we call a retention blueprint. Uh, and, it's, and it's dubbed this way because these are the things that are actually effectively driving retention or actually driving loyalty, which is an effect, and that increased loyalty is driving retention to the organization. So this is the key output that kind of Kevin talked about earlier and then highlighted in a little bit more of a detailed format in the other case study. Um, there were, you can see indicated by the blank lines there, I've kind of anonymized this a bit. I've also removed some things. There were two other key category, key experience categories that were taken out. Uh, but what you're seeing here are the three categories uh, that in effect actually represent 87% of the, all of the things that they're doing that are driving loyal to the organization. So let me touch on these because these were critical inputs in terms of helping us determine, well, what should we change about the existing experience uh, in the pilot to get a better outcome, right? And these are not our answers. These are answers that we derived from the donor. So that top box is, this is a Catholic organization and we're talking about their faith and that you can see that this is actually their Catholic faith and then the uh, elements that comprise that key experience bucket there, if you will, are representative of 50% of the reason why they support the organization. Okay, the, the religious identity is an extremely powerful one, especially with this organization. Now, they didn't need us to tell them and do the donor insight work to tell them that uh, being Catholic was important to supporting a Catholic organization. Okay, but what we've uncovered is when you look at the color coding of those segments, blue means it's something that is doing well, that they have a high performance rating. Red is something that is actually important, but has a low, a below average performance rating. Okay, so what you're seeing here is what we uncovered is that while that Catholic identity is so critical to this, they were doing, the organization was doing a bad job or a less than, less than ideal job of making the connection between being Catholic and how that aligned with supporting this organization. And it's something that we needed to help figure out in all the touch points that comprise that donor journey, how do we do a better job of reinforcing that connection uh, you know, at all these touch points. The second bucket there in the middle, we've kind of labeled donor services, also has a relative to the kind of the whole pie, 27% of the influencers are comprised in this bucket. Um, you know, Kevin talked in the model, uh, and you kind of see it on the right here with personal connection, this idea of, of building loyalty and relationships is, is through reciprocity and that personal connection uh, and, and, and achieving that. So particularly around this area of ever being asked for, the, for feedback, that has come up with some significant changes to the pilot. So you can see in here, again, the things that are in red are low performing versus the things that are in blue. And while we're great at thanking people when they donate, what we're not great at doing is asking people for their input, building some sort of reciprocity in the experience about how to engage with the organization. That became a critical input as to how do we solve for this and turn that red to blue in the pilot. And then that last piece is in the fundraising bucket where the main point, the main pain point here is on the frequency of solicitation. Um, now, this is this is 
something that was further reinforced in, in all the open and comment, which I'll actually share some of that as well. And it was also a known pain point for the organization, something high on their list to change and figure out how do we influence that. But as you know, as many of you know, that, you know, reducing frequency has, has you know, revenue uh, risk, if I say, and I use air quotes around that in terms of how do we manage that. So how do we actually continue to grow the program maintain the, re the retention or growth or increase the retention and grow revenue year over year by not just pulling on that one lever around frequency. And this is an organization, while that pain point was strong for them, it was because of the fact that that had been the main lever over time, is that when we needed to grow or when we needed to add revenue, what we did was we added solicitations, be it through the mail, online, increased telemarketing campaigns, so on and so forth. So once we got through the insights piece, we talked about this. There's a lot that goes into that. We've done a number of, uh, of, of webinars and, and, and presentations and white papers on, on measuring commitment and how you do that. And there's a lot to that, which we'll, if anyone's interested, we're happy to share specific examples. What this is I want to kind of touch on today is kind of once we did that work, how did we, and we reached an agreement that this is actually, uh, there's, meaningful changes that we can and should make to go to market. How did we get there? How did we get from the insights to actually putting this in market? And I think Roger alluded to this in the beginning. So much of the conversation now is mapping donor journeys, but we see very, very few organizations that are actually in market doing controlled and test pilots in the longitudinal form that you can actually measure significant change over time. Right. So how did we actually do this? And, and working with this group has been a, a tremendous experience. They have a very skilled team and they deserve a lot of credit as to how, how we get, got there. But and together we did some significant planning to identify the ways in which we're going to address those key areas that matter from the donors outside in point of view, um, but also kind of focusing on the metrics that matter. So as you can see on this slide, this is kind of our summary. Your main goal with any sort of strategic planning is to know going in that, you know, you're not going to be able to change everything. They have, like every organization, they have capacity issues, meaning that everyone's got, is wearing nine hats and has multiple jobs. So we have to organize ourselves so that at a minimum, we can ensure that we're going to do the most important things and we're going to do them very well. So overall goal remains the same as it does as you measure any program year over years. How do we increase net revenue and how do we increase donor retention? But we try to get more specific on that with looking at the kind of the key pet metrics that we will use to measure success. So we drilled down on how we would achieve those more macro goals, if you will, including how do we push people to online to digital. And that was not just because, you know, you read that the sky is falling and direct mail is dying, but because we found out that in another bucket that we didn't walk through, but that engagement, uh, there was quote unquote an engagement bucket. And there was a lot of things that, that this organization was doing online that were having a positive impact on retention and loyalty. They had an access to a, 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 a password protected donor portal where you could change and update information, get content, make donations, whatever you wanted. They had a very strong e-news communication uh, platform that was doing well, that were all high performing touch points. So it wasn't just how do we get people out of direct mail, but it was how do we actually move people towards the touch points that are actually matter. And this is, Kevin referred to this as scale. How do we get more people to more of the things that are most relevant and, and matter the most? So we looked at all those kind of metrics as to how we drive retention and net revenue. And then lastly, we tried to narrow down into a specific set of tactics that we're going to implement across the pilot to push on each of those metrics that you see there. And we've kind of since color coded these and we use this as a bit of a kind of a, just a, a jumping off point in our monthly meetings to talk about what are the things that we think we're doing well, what are the things that we think we are work, uh, we have in market but we can improve and what are the things that we haven't started working on yet that we want to. And we would kind of make decisions on where we spend our time as we kind of go into those things. So this became kind of a, a grounding point for every kind of meeting and saying, look, let our goal is to, these are the things, there are plenty of others, right? But these are the things that we're gonna push hard on as we kind of get into this to achieve uh, kind of positive ratings on the things that matter most that we identified in the study. 
The second piece, which has been tactical, but I want to kind of share with you and show you is that we've had a lot of questions around this is, is how did we do the audience selection? So as I said before, in this pilot, we did not actually have multiple segments that required multiple different versions uh, in there. It was legitimately a representative sample of the file. So we actually took a uh, basically a 10% nth of the active file and we put 10% into the into a control track and 10% of those people into a holdout cell and 10% of those people into a pilot track. Uh, and we made sure that we had representation of, of across all the things in that blue box at the top we wanted to make sure we had kind of a representative sample of the donors in the active file that have email address and then also registered for that portal that we had referred to. And then we started looking at how, what kind of omits and things do we apply as parameters to make sure we're working off a set of names that would, be, would have made it into every campaign uh, kind of if it were business as usual. So we weren't going to be forcing in names or didn't want to have names that were going to only be in some of the time and others that would be in all the time. So we, we ran out some simple omits of kind of omitting new donors that may in fact not actually have the context to say or to know that things have changed or things that needed to change um, or the prelapsing or the lapsed audiences that may or may not be in every appeal. Maybe they're only in a handful during the year. We, we omitted monthly donors and we omitted donors that already had preference codes applied to their record that they were only to be mailed one time a year or four times a year. So we were ultimately looking at just kind of getting to an audience that was going to always be in all the appeals and represented the donor journeys that we kind of mapped out in kind of, if you will, the quote unquote current state. So the audience selection process is not overly complex, but there's certainly a lot of worthwhile conversation to be had in this area. Uh, other things that we had talked about was looking at, do we want to omit hyper givers? You know, some blackbot or target uh, has, a bunch of kind of you know lapse tags and they call them tippers and there's all these other categories for these things but people that are giving five six times a year do we actually want to put them in the pile or just let them be we try to we decide to kind of include those and keep those people in um, but worthwhile conversation to be had internally as a group with your data team so on and so forth so as I had mentioned concurrently we had, we did a lot of the journey mapping on the current world so the pilot started last May. We're, we're over a year in market, as I alluded to before. So the view you're seeing here is, is essentially just a snapshot of the first three months. The, the, this is kind of in what we would call swim lanes in the CX space of kind of that top row is the current state or the, or the control track, and that bottom row is the pilot. And then these colored tiles that you're seeing is by month, at, oh, and we have three columns by month at the top. These colored tiles you're seeing represent individual touch points. The blue touch points are, are, and the color coding is for channel. So the blue touch, touch points are direct mail. The green touch points are for email. The red touch points are for a newsletter program. The black touch points are for the telemarketing channel. Uh, and then the individual icons you're seeing indicated on each of the tiles are, are essentially giving you some top line information about that touch point, whether they ask for money, if we are asking for feedback as well on, on the touch points if there's a select audience which is indicated by this little people icon that you kind of see here smattered throughout. Um, but most importantly are the, col the colored icons. The, the ones that you're seeing, the stop signs, the, uh, the kind of the repair indicators, the ad signs, so on and so forth. These are the touch points that we are indicating where we've added something, where we've dropped something, where we've changed something against the control. And what's critically important here is that what we, what we used to make those determining factors were largely based on what the donors told us what was working, not what was raising the least revenue or the most revenue, albeit that, that did actually play some role, of course, in, in the decisions that we made. But this is the exercise that you can't do without the donor insight. So kind of during this time, you can see in this bottom row, just in this three-month snapshot that we added uh, into, the, pro, into the, the track, or we replaced, if you will, we dropped these two appeals here. We added in this program announcement, which I'm going to talk, to, uh, talk about in a little bit of detail here shortly. We omitted uh, kind of one of the solicitation appeals, and we stopped the telemarketing acquisition that happened in this period of time. Uh, and we also modified 
this uh, newsletter package based on some of our behavioral science insight as to how we could actually improve kind of the interaction of, of, that, of that piece. So what I want to kind of talk about here is how we, how we I, sh I kind of explained how we built it from an internal structure perspective, but how did we introduce it from a donor's perspective? Because uh, this program announcement that we did, which you can see indicated here, we did it in direct mail. We also did an online version of that through email. Ended up being a huge element of the program success. And the intent was to communicate what was going to change, not just hope that the donors would feel the change for themselves. And we asked them, when we presented it, we asked them for their feedback on what they thought about those changes. So this is kind of in the, in a, in a, the direct mail package. It came from the, the, offer, the Office of Membership Services. It wasn't just simply, you know, another, you know, signed by a field person. It was kind of signed by the organization. And we were, we were very frank and upfront about, we have heard you loud and clear. We understand that we need to make changes based on the experience that we've served you up. And here's a, a snapshot of some of the things that you can expect. And then as a result, as part of that, we did not have, we did not ask for money. We did not have a reply device with a, you know, um, that, that had kind of a, a blank ask or a soft ask. We had a, a simple uh, kind of one page survey that was aiming to understand if we were in fact achieving or satisfying the pain points that these people had. Um, and and, and, and the, the returns of this were, were critical. This drove actually kind of three important pieces of insight for us. Uh, it, was, it was first the leading indicator of whether or not these changes would be perceived as better by the donors. Uh, it gave us a lot of opportunities for individual follow-up. We, we had a very high response rate to the mailing and to the email, and we captured individual information. So we actually knew that pe who the person was, and all of these people gave very pres prescriptive feedback about what they wanted or needed uh, as it relates to what matters most to them. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, we were actually able to move the needle on some of the most important metrics that we were chasing as part of the program. Right? We actually had 7% of the people that responded, we asked about whether or not they were interested in not receiving uh, uh, ongoing solicitations, but instead being come, become part of the monthly, a monthly giving program. 7% of the people in our pilot universe responded that they did want to do that. Um, as, I, as I showed you on the strategy slide, we are chasing kind of conversion to online. Almost 20% of the people that responded provided us their email address, which we did not have on file. And as a kind of a cherry on top, we actually generated over $30,000 of revenue in this mailing. And we did not, and again, it, we did not have a survey, uh, survey with an attached reply device or a soft ask or any reference to money whatsoever. It's people actually chose to write checks and put them into the, the mailing when they sent it back. So uh, it's kind of real quickly that we had done a bunch of uh, kind of text analysis to roll up all the feedback and, 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 and as I mentioned before, the organization, they worked hard to address comments where they could and where the opportunities presented themselves on an individual basis. The, only, the one point I want to make here, and this is uh, something that we have also done a lot of webinars and white papers on, but the idea of kind of getting in the business of, of collecting and acting on feedback using a, a platform that kind of gives it to you in a structured way is really valuable, right? So we were able to surface that there's the, the kind of the too much mail complaint um, and, and, and talk about kind of how they want to give and then and donor services work to kind of talk to those people. Part of the outcome of this was actually, we started chasing actually in, in some of our subsequent appeals, actually making this as important as kind of getting information about the donor. And we've, we've put uh, ask for feedback on the front of the reply device, which is suggesting that it's actually almost as important that we get their check mailed back as we do get their feedback about their experience. We, we did inserts that asked about, about that. And we also even included at times blank space for people to write so they didn't have to go and, uh, and you know, provide, find their own scrap paper and put it into the envelope. And we could scan these things very easily and be able to kind of convert this to text and do the text analysis on it. So what were the, the kind of the, those are kind of touching on some of the high points in terms of all the things that we changed. We really tried, we, we announced what we were doing. 
to, to everybody. We listened for feedback. We responded to as much of it as they could organizationally, and they continued to put more time and assets around that piece. We reduced the frequency of, of solicitations to this entire pilot track. We, uh, we really tried to ramp up kind of working with our behavioral scientists to how do we actually play up and strengthen and reinforce that individual identity that matters, that religious identity that matters to the organization. And we really kind of tried to scale up and be in the feedback business. That, I will tell you, unequivocally, was a silver bullet to kind of the success of what we were doing in a, in a critical piece. So on the results side, as I promised to share in the beginning, kind of a top line view of this, and I'll show you, I will, I will say one of the things that is, I think has made this such a success is the effort and investment of time by the team uh, at the organization and with us to find ways to be able to track the, the, um, the, the performance on an ongoing basis. Um, at, so this is showing you the, uh, the percentage difference in cumulative gross revenue between the control and the pilot tracks. And as you saw in that journey snap, snapshot that I showed you earlier, in those first three months, we had removed a lot of the solicitations asking for money across all channels. And not surprisingly, right out of the gate, we saw a significant decrease in gross revenue. But what we saw happen in subsequent months exceeded our own expectations in that we quickly began to see the gap reduce and by year end, we were less than 4% different on gross revenue. And through Q1, we've kind of further narrowed that gap to almost even on gross revenue. Now, here's where the reporting piece, I think, is critically important and it's kind of worth talking about because we didn't just do set up this pilot and with the intent to kind of design this year-long pilot, put it in market, and then stick our heads in the sand and wait until the end of the year to see how it did. We literally were tracking this in real time, making adjustments on things that we didn't think were working well and or capitalizing on the things that we saw strong returns, like that I, the example I shared on the feedback side. So overall, we removed six DM solicitations, 11 email solicitations. This view here is just showing you the, the DM solicitations that are associated with it. And what you can see is that the remaining appeals had a huge lift in their performance gains. So this top row is showing you individual appeals, which I've kind of coded out, and showing you the revenue raised. And then this is showing you where those appeals are removed. There's some small kind of noise where we got some small dollars that were kind of in or out or miscoded revenue. But where you see these kind of indicated lifts in green, this is showing you that this campaign had a 34% lift in revenue over the pilot one. Right now we were actually, and this is how we started to kind of clo make, close the gap where we lost some revenue. Um, we, and then we, we had subsequent all the way on down, this is kind of carrying into uh, their fiscal year kind of through year end. So we're currently tracking very close on overall gross, re gro gross <clears throat> excuse me, gross revenue um, but what it doesn't account for is the cost. So while we're tracking this on net, costs are not actually kept, as for many organizations, not kept in this database. So the cost savings overlaid by the number of mailings and email solicitations that we did not have to create uh, is a significant win for the organization. And keep in mind, this, this reduction in mail costs that we're referring to doesn't even take into account the savings of people time, internally consulting time, all of the kind of time, effort, and spend that's associated with campaign creation. Think about your own individual project plans of how many steps and when, how far in advance the, the planning starts for just one single mailing that you do. All that people time is things that can get re and the sick cost savings are things that get reinvested into the organization. The, the critical piece that, that matters so much here is that we had actually intended to carry this into year two because ultimately it's in year two where we would, where we would ex anticipate that more of our universe than the pilot was sticking around. Uh, and the organizations actually decided to flip the switch on a lion's share of their program and start just implementing these changes across the program. We'll continue to measure and monitor this, but they're actually kind of setting themselves up for immediate wins. So now as they're going into budgeting for the next fiscal year, we're actually now starting to free up significant uh, expense dollars on the expense side that they're looking to find out how do we invest this for growth? How do we actually continue this trend and play this out for the, for the full program? 
So I know we're up on time. Uh, Roger, kind of, I'm going to give it back to you here to kind of t to close us down on some oh. of the takeaways. Uh, okay, Josh. Thanks. Thanks very much. And Kevin, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. You know, one of the reasons I asked the guys to do this is that a while ago I was listening to a webinar from one of the big uh, consulting companies, and and they made a statement uh, that if you can uh, you you can conduct a journey mapping session without data, which is one of the beautiful things about it. Well, there's not anything beautiful about it. It would be disastrous. The afternoon or day or two-day retreat may be fun, and uh, it may be uh, a bonding exercise among uh, folks in the organization and their consultants, but it isn't, uh, it isn't very worthwhile, and that's, that's one of the reasons the agitator wanted to do this. I started the uh, session with a cartoon because in cartoons there is both humor and, uh, and truth, but uh, the, fact, the fact is that uh, the, the donor mapping process is important if you're going to truly call yourself a donor-centric organization, but you must know quantifiably, empirically, what experiences you're offering up to donors that are either keeping them with the organization or driving them away from the organization, and which ones are especially important and, uh, and which ones are not. So uh, I hope uh, this was, was beneficial. If you want more information, on this, uh, you can contact either uh, Kevin or Josh, and uh, they'll get you what you want. Or you can uh, send me an email to Roger at uh, the Agitator, and uh, I'll uh, I'll get back to you. I'm afraid we've run out of uh, time for questions, so we'll uh, we'll answer the questions we have individually. And as I said at the start, uh, we'll aggregate uh, the general ones and uh, and answer those, send them out to the whole group. So thanks very much for uh, being with us today and look forward to seeing you again soon in the future. Have a good 4th of July if you're in the United States, Canada Day if you're north of the border, and whatever you're doing in Europe, have fun, be safe, goodbye.